I am uh, John Breo. I'm Vice President of Public Policy, Telecommunications and Fraud at the National Consumers League. Uh, we are a consumer advocacy group here in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm also very happy to be an FPF Advisory Board member, um, but I'm even more happy tonight to be uh, have the opportunity to chat about Professor Daniel Citron's uh, amazing paper on the role of um, uh, the role of state AGs in privacy protection. Um, I think this is an incredibly timely issue to be uh, bringing not only to the uh, privacy papers for policymakers uh, process, but to Congress now. Uh, these, uh, as, a, as an advocate uh, here in Washington, we hear the term regulatory humility thrown around a lot uh, with the incoming administration. And I think certainly uh, for those of us who believe in uh, stronger consumer privacy protections, we are looking to the AGs uh, for leadership in this area. And so I think it's with that uh, in mind that uh, we were, I was really happy to, to read your paper. Um, for those of us uh, who, who uh, have not had the chance uh, to meet you before, uh, Professor Citron is uh, one of the leading privacy experts in the country. Uh, as I think was mentioned earlier, uh, it seems like not a year goes by that one of your papers is not uh, an award winner in this competition. Um, but she is, uh, when, you're, when you're not writing awesome papers, you're a professor at the University of Maryland School of Law. So thank you for, for being with us tonight. Um, let me just start off, for those of us who haven't read all 74 pages of your paper. Um, and he's not counting. I'm not right? counting, but no, no. I did read it. I was no one, of the, one of the judges, exactly. Uh, could you give us uh, the, uh, the Cliff Notes version of uh, your paper and uh, the basic points? So thank you so much uh, for, I'm so thrilled to be here and thank you for the award and John for reading the all 74 pages and maybe 350 footnotes perhaps, I think. Um, but no, so the Cliff Notes version is that state attorney generals have been making privacy policy um, for a long time now, but in many respects they're kind of the unsung heroes of data privacy and security. Um, and they have been making and setting privacy norms with regard to um, that we even have privacy policies. Um, you know, state AGs were on the case arguing that companies should let consumers know the data that they're collecting, using, and sharing um, back to the data to the mid-90s to late-90s. And state AGs have been filling in other gaps in the law um, with regard to uh, making sure that consumers' choices are not overridden um, if they make privacy choices on their browsers, that there are some restrictions on uses of certain um, banking databases, that not only are they kind of creating a shadow fair information practice principles um, individually and also in a multi-state, often acting in a multi-state capacity, but they're also sort of forging new substantive areas. Um, with regard to sexual privacy, youth privacy, protections for in bankruptcy proceedings. And so the, what I aimed to do in the paper was both to describe what state AGs are doing on the ground, right? Setting, in, setting norms, filling in gaps in the law, also acting as like the boots on the ground, so to speak, uh, of enforcement and data security and in harmonizing no, norms set by the FTC. But then also after describing that because we really didn't have in the literature a description of what they were doing, but then also to, to make some prescriptions about what they could do better um, and, and wrestle with the question that federal lawmakers will from time to time raise, especially in the data breach notification context, is should we preempt the role of state AGs in enforcement? So of course my answer is gonna be no, but I have a, a, a reason why that we can talk about, but um, that's also something that I wrestled with in the paper was that, you know, this fictitious idea that you're going to have all 50 plus six AGs jumping on the matter on any case is really illusory. And we often see them work together. Um, so that, I don't know if that's Cliff Notes. That's law professor Cliff Notes, <laughs> right? Like. Well, it's, uh, I think it's, it's a great introduction uh, to the paper. I'll tell you one of the things that um, I was really impressed by with this paper was the amount of, of original research that went into it. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, FOIA, dozens and dozens of FOIA requests. Uh, 
um, because, as you mentioned, this is an area that, that hasn't gotten a lot of, uh, of research. Um, why do you think that is? Why do you think that state AGs and the role they play in, in, in privacy and data protection um, hasn't gotten uh, more, uh, more attention until now? Right, because when you talk to practitioners, uh, and I had the wonderful chance to talk to Chris Wolf and others about their experiences with state AGs. Practitioners often are on the case. They realize that state AGs are on it. Um, but why hasn't there been sustained study? Um, in part because so often as an enforcement matter, how they're doing it is through assurances of voluntary compliance. In part because it's only recently that the, I think they're acting in a multi-state capacity, bringing enforcement actions. Um, and in part, maybe just, you know, because they're 50 plus six, you know, they're AGs that in any given state, you know, we're paying attention to what they're doing. But the, the fact that they're truly national, they're creating policy on a national stage through multi-state activity and coordinated action, um, I think we now realize we should pay attention to them. Right. So, uh, you know, states are often called the laboratories of democracy. Uh, and and certainly in, in the area that I work on, consumer protection, that's the case. Um, where do you think uh, states today are being laboratories of democracy when it comes to privacy and data protection? And what's interesting is I want to almost redefine the Brandeisian laboratories of democracy, which, which conceives of states as having their own little experiments in competition with each other and not often working together, but there's another way to understand this laboratory as one in which we're seeing partisan fights that we see on the federal level. Also, interestingly, not necessarily partisan, but we're seeing national efforts. That is the experiment is joining together across the divide. Dem you know, it's often the leaders are Democrats, but we also see Republican AGs like in Texas take the lead on these issues and they're joining together. So the laboratory, isn't that they're insular silos experimenting and maybe borrowing for each other, but there's another kind of horizontal experimentation where they're joining together in multi-state activity and that itself is a laboratory. So can you give us an example or two of, of those multi-state activities that, that, that fall into that bucket of, um, fall in that bucket of uh, laboratories uh, for privacy? Right, so, so one case I think is really worth underscoring is the Google cookie browser case. So Google had, um, in its privacy policy said it, it was not gonna ignore consumers do not track decisions in their browsers. Um, and it turns out that both Google and then advertisers, including Point Roll, were deploying code that would reverse consumers' privacy settings um, and overrode consumer choices. Now, the FTC brought an action against Google on the grounds that, look, you broke a promise. You said you were going to keep your promises. You said this, you made this promise. You weren't going to override people's browser settings. And you broke that promise. And the FTC invited 44 states to join um, in a settlement with the FTC um, on the grounds of broken promises. And the, the executive committee of the state AGs, a, a group of AGs who ran the multi-state investigation, declined and said, no, no, we actually think this case is about much more than just a broken promise. It's about how we think it's an unfair practice to reverse consumers' choices for privacy and flip their no-track settings on, you know, to track, uh, that that in itself is an unfair practice as they understand their unfair and deceptive practice laws. And so they set, in some sense, a norm right, that says, even if you didn't make a promise companies, don't reverse people's chosen privacy settings. So, um, you know, in the context of data security, uh, when we talk about the roles that states play, uh, one of the terms that, that often comes up in a, a negative light is this idea of, of a, a patchwork of breach notification and data security laws. So. Uh, if we assume for a moment that my hypothesis is right, and you're, that yours is right, that the AGs are going to become even more active than they currently are uh, in, in, in the years to come, um, what, uh, do, do they start to become vulnerable 
to this argument that they are creating patchwork privacy regulations and that uh, agencies like the FTC or Congress need to step in and harmonize right. in, or, or is that code for preemption? Right, no, and I think you know we've seen year after year suggestions that we are gonna preempt, that we're gonna create a national standard for data breach notification and then preempt, some bills suggest even preempting state AGs as enforcers of those laws. And often those bills are pretty watered down. And I think the, the model we should look to in some sense is HIPAA, which set a national, which set a floor, right? And it welcomes states to innovate at the legislative level, right? They can have stronger protections uh, and state AGs enforce HIPAA alongside the FTC in a, in a partnership. Um, and so my hope is that we need state AGs enforcing these laws. So if we have a preemptive federal data breach notification law, my hope is certainly that it's not weak, right? That it takes the best of the experiments we've seen uh, in HIPAA and others and sets a floor allowing for state, state experimentation and greater protection. But even if we don't do that, at least the floor should be strong, right? And that state AGs need to be enforcers. We desperately need them on the case. We know the FTC had 55 in total data breach security investigations and cases. And because we have the state AGs that bring individual as well as multi-state ac actions, we need all hands on deck. Great. So in your paper, you, uh, you identify an over-reliance on these uh, informal agreements between AGs. Um, and that, that, uh, that, that lack laws um, to back them up as a weakness. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what is the impact of this? And if you can, uh, in, a, in, a, in a practical way, like how, how would a consumer like me see that happen? Uh, how, how would I experience the impact of these informal agreements? And is that a good thing or a bad thing for me as a consumer? Okay, so the assurance of voluntary compliance is a way for a state AG's office to basically open an investigation and close it at the same time. AGs often have investigations that last a long time, but how they settle it without bringing litigation is through an assurance of voluntary compliance. And in many states, though not at the multi-state level and not in Maryland, woohoo, my state, and in Iowa, they, they will, the more typical ones have pretty weak terms. They're like a paper tiger in the sense of it says you have to pay X penalty, because you can get penalties under most state UDAP laws. Um, but they, they, what they say is that if you violate the ABC, that it's not in itself a viol it's not in itself going to provoke further penalties, that if the company violates the ABC, then the AG has to then bring a case, and it's only a prima facie evidence of a violation. Um, and so in many respects, one could say, they could just ignore them then, because then they could say, all right, state AG, sue me, <laughs> you know, for a second or third violation. And so what I argue is that we ought to look to the multi-state ABCs, as well as Maryland and, Ohio and Iowa, where the, by the terms, by themselves, the ABCs are, are quite strong. If you breach the terms of an ABC, you are immediately owe penalties that will aggregate the longer the violation continues. And they're enforceable in court. Uh, so we need them to be meaningful, right? If we're gonna rely on, um, if we're gonna make any law in any sense through assurances of voluntary compliance, they ought to have terms that people are gonna write about, going to respect. You know, the FTC has a settlement agreement and the next day everyone's reading it. It's all over IIPP, we're all talking about it, right? FPF, we're gonna get an email, right, from Jules and John and Chris explaining it. So I want that to be true as well of the state AG's ABCs. Great, um, so we're gonna uh, turn to questions in just a minute, um, so just kind of get your minds working on what your question wants to be for Professor uh, Citron. But um, this year, you were not only uh, the awardee uh, of a, of, for this paper, but you were also the co-author of another PPM, PPPM uh, winning paper uh, with Daniel Solov. Uh, and it was about uh, data breach harms. Can you talk a little bit, maybe give us the two minute cliff notes on that? Okay, sure. I promise I'll try to be really cliffy of cliff notes. Um, so 
So it's so often um, that data breach harms. Uh, we heard um, Congressman Barton talk about um, how privacy is often underrated. And that's true of in data breach cases. Courts will throw out litigation on the grounds that there's no harm, both for standing and for the cause of action of negligence and other claims. And what courts have consistently refused to see is the harm of an impairment of both anxiety or emotional distress as well as one's increased risk or vulnerability to theft, to fraud, reputational harm. And so what Dan and I argue in our piece is that look, in a lot of er other areas of law, even in tort law, we recognize emotional harm, anxiety, as well as, I mean, there, risk is something that companies know how to handle well. It's not a new concept. And increased risk in other areas of even tort law, we understand, we translate it into litigation that will have an effect to intern, require companies to internalize the externalities they, that consumers bear. And so we make the case for both risk and anxiety to be recognized as cognizable harms. Great. So uh, I think we have a few more minutes uh, for questions. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you and, and please do identify yourself. Yes. So, so the, I think the question I heard was, do you see any particular state AG standing out in terms of student data privacy or student privacy? Student privacy, yes. yes. Uh, so California and Delaware. Um, you know, we saw California Attorney General's, uh, you know, helpful in help passing the student privacy law, but also with really helpful white papers on how you can comply with California student privacy law and best practices. And Delaware, AG Matt Den, um, who's new to the office, but really is behind student privacy efforts. Um, they're doing a rulemaking on their newly adopted rule, um, state legislation. And so I think we should look, we can eyeball both of those states, California AG and Delaware. Thank you. Uh, question in the back. The question was, uh, do states uh, in the application of their uh, UDAP laws apply the same cost benefit analysis that the FTC applies uh, when it exercises its unfairness authority? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right. And so there are many UDAP laws that do not have a harm requirement or a cost benefit analysis. But in, in my interviews with 4AGs and then career staff from 13 states, and in the way we see it applied, they really meaningfully do a cost benefit analysis in the sense of there's such limited resources. So they're only gonna bring investigations where they really feel that there wasn't, um, that the behavior either was egregious and the harm significant to consumers. They just don't have the time and money. And so in some sense, at least they all said to me, we think really hard about harm and we think really hard about the benefits of certain activities, and if it's if the costs are, or you know, if it, if there's an imbalance and it's worth pursuing. Do we have time for one more question? One more. Any other questions? Okay. Well, not seeing any, uh, I will ask that we all give Professor Citron a round of applause for an amazing paper. Thank you.